Welcome to what is now the 21st seminar of 21 in this SEB Emerging Issues and Conservation Seminar series. Um, in the series, we feature articles that have recently been published, our early view online, um, or recently accepted in the three SEB journals. Those, of course, being Conservation Biology, Conservation Letters, and Conservation Science and Practice. Uh, my name is Martin Strauss. I am a senior lecturer at the University of South Africa in the Department of Environmental Sciences, and I'm also an associate editor of Conservation and Science and Practice, and it's in that capacity that I've been organizing these seminars um, during 2021. Um, before I introduce our speakers for today, um, please note that you are welcome to post comments and questions um, within the chat. You are equally welcome at the end of the seminar to unmute yourself um, when we open for questions and to ask your questions directly to, to our speakers. Um, then maybe just a, a request to please keep your microphones muted, um, maybe even videos off, and then we can sort of unmute and switch video on afterwards when we get to, to question and answer session. And then I think we, we're ready to go. Um, so it's my great pleasure to introduce you today to Maria Pascal and to Jacob Phelps, who's our, who are our speakers for today. Um, I'm going to start with Maria. Um, Mrs. Mas Pascual is a development professional with educational degrees in economics, law and food and nutrition, and 25 years of international experience. Back in 2011, she co-founded Legal Atlas to leverage the power of technology in generating legal intelligence to improve those laws currently hindering environmental, social, and economic development opportunities. Um, since then, Legal Atlas has been involved in 30 plus research projects, compiling, analyzing, and comparing legal approaches used by countries in subjects such as EIA, wildlife trade, anti-corruption, marine fish, fisheries, forest, um, etc. And as a result has participated in developing legal agendas to guide countries in legal reform for particular topics. Maria has been involved in the development of the Legal Atlas online platform and all the taxonomies used to generate dynamic legal intelligence from static legal documents. Before Legal Atlas, Maria's research experience includes qualitative and quantitative assessments related to child nutrition, international trade, small and medium enterprises, value chains, bank financing, land ownership, um, and others for clients, including the Pan American Health Organization, USAID, the Ministry of Economy in Guatemala, the Ministry of Agriculture, Irrigation and Livestock in Afghanistan, and the EU. And then joining her is Jacob Phelps. So Dr. Jacob Phelps is an environmental uh, social scientist with a particular interest in policy, legal and governance dimensions of tropical biodiversity conservation and sustainable resource management. Trained in geography and natural sciences, he draws on a wide range of methods and approaches. He's a senior le lecturer at Lancaster Environment Center in the UK, from where he leads the conservation governance law and, and coordinates conservationlitigation.org. Um, with that, it's over to you. I think, uh, Jacob, you're starting and then Maria takes over and then back to you again. Great. Thank you very much, Martin. Thank you, everyone, for, for joining us. <clears throat> we're really, we're really uh, delighted and, and flattered to be invited to present. And indeed, I think this, this work with, with Maria and our other colleagues at Legal Atlas does reflect something uh, emerging and distinct. My interest is in the institutions, formal and informal, associated with how we protect biodiversity and, and, and sustainably use biodiversity. Uh, and increasingly I've come to appreciate the fact that the, the, the law as it is written, uh, although it is often inconvenient, uh, often frustrating, uh, really matters and is a sector that I, is a, is a, you know, as much as conservationists talk about law, I think that we often don't engage with it terribly deeply. And, you know, law, law sets out not only formal rules, but it shapes our social norms. It sends social signals about what is and what isn't okay. Of course, it also serves to punish violators, to potentially deter future perpetrators of, of different types of uh, environmental harm. Of course, it also has its limitations. It's contested, often considered not legitimate. 
As conservationists, we're often deeply frustrated that it fails to reflect our science and best practice. You know, the law almost by definition is top down uh, and often linked to, you know, egregious colonial legacies. Um, and indeed, we spend, I think, as conservationists, a great deal of time complaining about how ineffective it is. But with those caveats, the reality is that formal law legislation is ubiquitous, hegemonic, and part of our lives. And as I mentioned, I think we often, as a community, don't really engage with its mechanics, perhaps quite deeply enough. And so the work through which we're working, uh, the, the, the topic on which we're specifically focused often, for example, is, is wildlife crimes, a sector with which many conservationists will have, you know, some sort of relationship, whether it's focusing specifically on issues of illegal wildlife trade or of taxa that we might be studying that are impacted by a range of different wildlife crimes. But one thing's for sure is that uh, for many academics, policymakers, uh, 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 conservation practitioners within within our group, there's often a strong sentiment that we, you know, that we need to be, you know, getting tough on wildlife crime. We need to be addressing these sorts of offenses seriously in an effort to protect biodiversity. But equally, of course, huge concerns and growing concerns around the overcriminalization of wildlife offenses. Um, that we're not targeting the right types of offenders to make these, you know, to make our, our enforcement of wildlife legislation uh, strong enough, or equally, you know, debates around whether countries that have signed up to CITES have domestic legislation that allows them to actually operationalize their international commitments. Regardless of where you are in the conservation sphere, we're often running up against legislation and specifically legislation that dictates what can and cannot be done with wildlife. And as part of that, again, enforcement really comes in as a strong refrain. Across international platforms, we have heard for, for decades now, calls for somehow, again, strengthening enforcement, strengthening legislation, whether it's the London Conference on Illegal Wildlife Trade, asking us and asking nations across the world to recognize illegal wildlife trade as a serious and organized crime, a, def a, a, a term that has a specific legal definition or if it's the Hanoi statement talking about building legal frameworks that are stronger, or, you know, uh, aplicando penas y multas, applying uh, of, of fines and sanctions that are consistent with the scale of, of, of the crime that is committed. Across all of these different types of uh, international debates and platforms, we often see this call for strengthening rules, strengthening frameworks, strengthening enforcement. And this is also reflected in the work of many different conservation NGOs who across the world have and continue to invest a great deal of effort and resources into, again, strengthening enforcement, often with, you know, very strong conservation outcomes. You know, here's just an example from Indonesia, one of the jurisdictions in which I work particularly. Uh, WCS is incredibly, uh, you know, in terms of conservation outcomes, successful and well-supported wildlife crimes unit talking about, you know, increasing number of sting operations. So that is not just investigating and prosecuting, but of course, behind that are the laws that they are trying to uphold, right? You can't prosecute and investigate and, and, and operationalize a law that doesn't exist. And of course, then training prosecutors. Well, training prosecutors in what? In, of course, the law, in this legislation that under lies uh, so much of what we're dealing with in conservation. And here's another example from Indonesia, and specifically this is a criminal case of a wildlife trade, a criminal conviction and a successful prosecution of a wildlife trade case. You see for a, a whole range of illegal trade of many different species and, and different body parts um, that were ultimately confiscated and destroyed. And you can see here the prosecutor was requesting based on the law a certain type of imprisonment and fines and then the judge interpreted that in a certain way and you can see that there was a there was a there was a sanction that was delivered now this sort of decision is premised of course in what the law says so when we're when we're talking about getting tough on wildlife crime or strengthening enforcement these are the sorts of things that we're that we're of course con concerned with 
And there's a huge amount of effort that is going into legal revisions and strength and enforcement of legal provisions around the world. Whether this is the establishment of new legislation, like I mentioned earlier, the establishment of domestic CITES laws that might allow a country to operationalize its international commitments to the Convention on International Trade. There's also, and Maria is going to speak about this further, a huge amount of efforts in many different countries, very right now very heavily across many countries of the African continent, of revising existing legislation. And that might be updates to species lists or updates to closed loopholes that have come to our attention. And in many cases, it often involves increasing sanctions, uh, you know, with growing recognition and concern over biodiversity loss, trying to make sure that our laws match the gravity of that situation. There are also efforts around the world to try and harmonize legislation to make sure that crimes, environmental crimes in one jurisdiction uh, are also addressed with a similar severity in another jurisdiction. And as part of that, even efforts to set minimum standards to make sure that different, you know, that there's not low hanging contexts in which committing wildlife offenses are perhaps not taken seriously, that create avenues for, for perpetrators to enter into, particularly when we're talking about, you know, corporatized crime or organized crime, whether it's e-waste uh, dumping or illegal wildlife trade. And at the same time, we also have huge, albeit very frustrating and often unfortunate efforts of deregulation, whether it's degazettement of protected areas or removing species from protected or endangered species lists. All of these things are continually happening. And they are always in relation, of course, to social norms and de facto practices on the ground, but they are also deeply concerned with the de jure, with the law, and with the law as it's written. And as conservationists, if we're interested in updating legislation to reflect our science, we have to make sure we understand that legislation. If we want to make sure that our uh, legislation is better enforced, well, we have to understand what that, legis that baseline legislation is. Equally, if we're concerned with over-criminalization, well, over-criminalization of what? These are the very granular questions that I have come to realize that I often don't understand very well in my work. These are the mechanics uh, of conservation governance, at least within the formal sector, that I've become increasingly interested in. Strength and enforcement, strength and legislation of what laws, for what species, get tough on wildlife crime, okay, but what types of sanctions and at what scales and under what conditions? And so it's through asking those types of questions that I developed a relationship with Legal Atlas, which Maria is going to speak to you a little bit further, but an organization that is very much focused uh, on understanding the law as it is written, and then thinking deeply about what that actually means for environment and conservation. And so what we realized in this project, which is part of a broader project called um, the WILDS project funded by the UK government uh, through the Illegal Wildlife Trade Challenge Fund, when we've been exploring different approaches to sanctioning wildlife crimes, we realized or we weren't all talking about the same thing. We weren't talking about the same laws, the same context, the same species. And when we wanted to compare how different countries were approaching sanctioning of illegal wildlife trade, we realized that we couldn't even have a competent discussion among, within our team across different legal jurisdictions, countries, uh, and continents, because we weren't talking about the same thing. We weren't talking about the same laws. We weren't talking about the same context. And so what we found we needed was some sort of a tool that enabled us to have a competent conversation, but also to make comparisons across jurisdictions. Because when I came to Maria and I said, well, how do, how do Costa Rica and Indonesia compare in terms of their enforcement of wildlife conservation laws? What wildlife conservation laws? And indeed, what wildlife are we even talking about? So I'll turn it over to Maria, who's going to describe how we took those questions and Maria, including through, you know, a decade now of work through Legal Atlas, have come up with an approach to thinking systematically about legal analysis in a way that allows us, hopefully, as conservationists to speak a little bit more specifically when we are proposing to get tough on wildlife crime. So over to you, Maria, please. Thank you. So, share my screen. I'm on the screen. 
You are. Give me a couple of seconds. I just need to put this in the presentation. Okay, so thank you, Jacob. Great introduction. Um, so, as he was kind of saying, Legal Atlas was created specifically to to try to make a contribution uh, in the development space as an interface of all these. Uh, legal documents that are affecting on the field any development worker, environmental, wildlife managers, but also uh, any other kind of, of workers and try to and try to deal down and increase understanding, increase understanding of how things are being done, how law can get needs the context of timing, the context of a geography, how law relates to each other, how law sh should be analyzed to be comparable across countries, because our goal is to deliver something that provides actionable uh, information, right? Uh, working with the stakeholders on the field and governments to really uh, bring some light to, uh, to a situation that is highly, highly complex. For doing all our work, the truth is that development of taxonomies is the, is the foundational element because this would allow us to classify, aggregate laws, disaggregate laws, and be able to, yeah, to compare across countries. Um, Legal Atlas is, is, is focused on methods. And the methods that we are looking for are applicable globally and also across topics, right? So now we are talking about the topic of wildlife, but this is the list of some of the topics we have been working from anti-corruption, forest, organized crime, and many others could be added based on, on needs. Um, in, in, in analyzing these legal libraries, like we have developed several global taxonomies and this is the moment working specifically with wildlife legislation that we found that we need to develop a specific topic a taxonomies to to have these tools to better compare laws across countries right so this project that jacob was mentioning uh, helped us to contribute to the development of offenses and penalty tool for analysis and um, this is a uh, Jacob was talking, was launching this question about what laws, right? This is a snapshot of the Legal Atlas platform. It shows the wildlife trade legal framework in Angola. In green are the countries that we have been studied this past decade. We have, I think, almost 80 jurisdictions that we were able to compile law related to wildlife trade. For Angola, we have approximately 32 pieces of legislation that has something to do for wildlife, right? This is the, the first step of complication. We are not talking about a wildlife law, right? It's a, it's a full set of legislation. Uh, then that when we start applying some taxonomies, we, we, we start having the first basic tools to compare a uh, difference between countries. This view show us uh, the same 32 laws divided between constitutional law, national law, and national regulation. You can imagine that these graphics uh, are reproduced by every country, right? Then we can have views on legal strategy. That means that the type of legislation that countries use to regulate a subject. This, uh, this tells us a lot. Uh, the fact that, for example, a country is not using health legislation to regulate wildlife trade issues, it maybe speaks of some weakness to control uh, zoonotic diseases, for example, right? Uh, so each of the pieces is adding to the analysis. Uh, here is, for example, uh, another analysis where, for again, for wildlife trade legislation, there is a list of key elements that is important to be able to compare and I've been selected protected species and the database is able to tell us for Cameroon, Rwanda and Indonesia, what are the laws that are talking about protected species and then if I will click the plus, it will give me the, the specific legal provision. Yeah? So the first step is just converting the library in something that is 
a little bit more actionable uh, to help us in this understanding and, and rebelling what is going on, right? So specifically for the development of this taxonomy, we follow several steps that I'll explain more in detail in the, in the, in the article, in the paper. I'm not gonna uh, go through all. I, I'm gonna go a little bit more in detail between some of the steps here that have some cool, cool things to show. But basically in a very raw summary, I will say like what we did is putting together a list of source vocabulary or candidate terms for a taxonomy that it was more than 1500 terms and through classification, aggregation, analysis of semantics and linguistics, we came with a four level taxonomy that has 500 elements. And this is all related to wildlife crimes. Uh, this source vocabulary, uh, like, Every taxonomy has to start in, in some specific place, right? So our taxonomy start in selecting eight, eight jurisdictions that you can see here listed. Uh, and also some bibliography that we identified that were specific on wildlife uh, crimes. So we put together all the legal frameworks for, for wildlife uh, legislation and we screen all these documents it was which moved this approximately 242 documents and we screen all the documents until identifying exactly the laws that we're mentioning specifically sanctions right not, not all laws include a sanctioning part and from there we were able to take out up to 15 uh, 1548 uh, candidate terms, right? Expressions of how countries are uh, criminalizing or penalizing uh, acts related to wildlife trade. Okay, and some issues here. Okay, the couple of things to, yeah, to, to, to give you a, a more exact idea on the complexity, right? This uh, screen is showing the 32 different expressions that we find to describe the semantic concept of illegal, uh, illegal like hunting wildlife, right? Illegal hunting of wildlife. So um, there is many ways that country are talking about fina and many ways that country are many verbs that are being used to describe the action of hunting, right? From taking, trapping, killing, poaching, catching, collecting, eliminating. So a taxonomic analysis forces us to, to, through several iteration of the list, we were like just grouping terms that look alike, then grouping terms that we felt that they were synonyms. And then uh, obviously from all of them, we had to choose uh, where was the best way uh, or the in this case, the, the best verb to describe uh, this illegal hunting, right? And, and we did that based on frequency of the terms. So for example, in this, in, for this set, right? Uh, at the end, we select the, the word hunt and hunting with 152 uh, um, repeatances was the, the preferred one. And all the others are being collected to create uh, um, a collection of synonyms and definition of every term. Uh, examples of other cases, right? For example, breeding wildlife, uh, it's, it's mentioned as nurturing, growing, farming, rearing uh, wildlife. Even the term wildlife itself, you can see the variety of terms used in every jurisdiction to refer to is from forest animals, game, biota species, animals, wildlife species, right? And so only after understanding uh, how every country um, uses language, we, can, we, we are ready to start grouping uh, and comparing. Another cool thing of the method, or, or I mean, yeah, it was uh, the, when we start analyzing the legal provisions, uh, like in a very anatomic uh, view, trying to separate and split uh, each sentence. 
Uh, for example, in this one, there is a real case, is persons found guilty of intentionally hunting or attempting to hunt without a permit shall be fined $100. It's clear in this sentence that the penalty uh, needs to be isolated, right? We don't need the penalty at this point because we are talking about creating a taxonomy of the offenses. But when we see the definition of these offenses, uh, we make the exercise of isolated the pure criminal act from those other elements that we're talking and speaking about uh, crime circumstances. Uh, this, uh, we call it facets, right? It's uh, different facets of the crime. It uh, was the only way to arrive to a taxonomy that, that was bearable, right? Even 500 terms, because the amount of combinations that we will get if we start having all the facets combined with all the possible um, criminal acts, then it will, yeah, we will just have a taxonomy that will not be useful. So finding these facets that I'm listing here, we found a, a, a total of nine facets or types of crime circumstances uh, used to define wildlife crimes. Uh, some, the first one are related to motivations, right? Some of the, it's not illegal hunting, it's illegal hunting for profit, illegal hunting from sports, right? In other uh, places, they are mentioning that the the crime is only inside a protected area or outside a protected area. Crimes can be based degree of completion, could be planned, attempted or completed, and so on, right? Uh, legal status of the wildlife could be protected and not protected. So all these are the elements that we are taking out of the taxonomy. Uh, and to, to put an example of how this is being done or how it applies, right? This is a, a real example. So this is a sentence I, I already took out the, the part of the penalty, but the sentence reads, knowingly smuggling or attempting to smuggle wildlife, including live and dead specimens, its parts and derivative products listed as protected species. So it, the complexity here is that you just need to isolate the criminal act that in this case is smuggling and then use the, the choices of the facets to, to annotate like the kind of limitations or the circumstances that this specific country is going to require to criminalize smuggling wildlife. Now, in this case, so we see attempting here, we see that says knownly, we see, yeah, all parts, so we are just checking all parts, only protected species, right? Uh, so in this way, we can convert something that is yeah, very specific in something generic that has potential for comparison. And I had another example, but I think I'm gonna skip it because it doesn't add. So at the end, we have this taxonomy that has four hierarchy levels. Level one has 16 uh, big categories. We organize it mainly based on the value chain of, of wildlife trade. I mark it in blue. You can see from, from wild to market, right? Uh, offenses related to conservation, then hunting, hunting weapons, transportation, storage, processing, trade, foreign trade, and all this. And then we have some others that were transversal and were more related to animal welfare and also forgery and obstruction of justice. So we couldn't feed that on the, on the value chains and we created special categories for them. This is a snapshot of how it looks the list, right? You need to imagine a list of 500 items, items and, and just for size purposes, I selected, for example, this section that is the number two offenses related to hunting. And then it has the sub levels of hunting wildlife, hunting without authorization, hunted in prohibited areas. And then you are having the, the, different, the different levels. Um, okay. I, yeah. So in applying this, uh, one thing that we, yeah, like a, like a secondary product that we, that we discover is that 
for example, once we have the, the taxonomy, right, we went back to the same countries and tried to respond that yes or not, uh, if, if countries are criminalizing these specific acts, right? Um, and it's, interested, it's interesting that the, even if you apply the taxonomy for understanding um, the design of penalties, uh, you can you can have yeah the, the power um, the analytic power goes beyond. For example, it's one thing that the legal atlas we primarily do is we always look at the value chain of of the wildlife trade because because regulation tends to concentrate in the in the wild part, right? In the, in the hunting part, in the first part of the of the um, value chain, and also in trade and import export. And then the things in the middle tend to get not so well regulated, including transportation, storage, purchase, possession. So in this case, it's easy to see like, okay, so these countries doesn't have a gap because they are really penalizing transportation of illegal wildlife. Like many in many countries, we find a void or a blank in this kind of crimes. Then, for example, the crime of import and export of protected species without site the certificate. Sorry, there is a missing word here. Uh, it is also helpful when we do analysis for national compliance of, of in this case, the CITES convention, right? And then many other of the crimes are related to different policy approaches that countries are choosing to manage their wildlife. Um, we see, yeah, we see very big difference uh, in, this, in this approach of allowing or not allowing selling wildlife meat uh, based on uh, tradition or indigenous subsistence or yeah many factors uh, make some countries forbidden yeah we have Brazil Cambodia and Kenya making this a crime and, the, and for the other countries uh, not and also uh, wildlife management is based on, on wildlife permits right basically all countries uh, tend to have the hunting permit and site this permit but uh, other jurisdictions are also having permits for research, for wildlife photography, for possession, for trade, right? So this is a way also to evaluate quickly and compare between countries' policy approaches in, in permitting. Uh, one thing also to highlight is the complexity that this is, it can be a one-to-many relationship. That means that we have, when we have one one item in the in the taxonomy that is going to be hunting wildlife with a facet of protected. It doesn't mean if I go to Brazil, this is this is the real case for Brazil. Brazil has four different laws: the protected areas law, the fauna. Ways to yeah, to draft the, the penalty, but all four are connected to one single item of the taxonomy, right? So the complexity can be high as countries uh, have complex legal system. And it's also a great tool to see, we are seeing contradictions, we are seeing countries, because these things happen, we are seeing countries where administrative fines are much higher than criminal fines, for example, and it's because one law is more updated than the other, right? Um, and here to, to close, the taxonomy is still like a living document. It was created based on information of eight countries, right? And our idea is that as soon as, as we keep implementing in analyzing different jurisdictions, new ideas or new terms can be added or we can polish the, the wording of every item. So with another UK DEFRA project, um, we are currently implementing this licit project for the illicit traffic of cheetahs in the Horn of Africa. So because it's very focused in, in fighting illegal wildlife crime, we use the taxonomy to complete the analysis for the four jurisdictions we are studying, right? And I choose here uh, to bring all crimes related to the hunting of using illegal means of methods, right? The taxonomy is giving us for the first time a very 
a very complete list of the types of means that are prohibited by different jurisdictions. And for the first time, we can have a like a snapshot of, of how are the difference in the countries, right? And and again, easy to see Somalia, it's it's preparing his fierce modern wildlife legislation these days, but is the, the current one is is dated back in the 60s or 70s. So the whole section of means uh, allow means for hunting it was missing in the in the law. So nothing is criminalized, right? Then we have a country like Somalia that has forbidden all hunting. So it, it, this crime does not apply because it's just, yeah, that the, the crime will be hunting. It will be not hunting using drugs, uh, traps, for example. And then we see here some, some um, crimes that exist where it looks like a contradiction. And yes, there is a contradiction, right? There is, there is a, an old law with a section that has not been superseded that was talking about, about um, means of hunting, right? And then we have Ethiopia and Yemen with a very different approach with, with Ethiopia criminalizing uh, more hunting methods than, than Yemen. And based on this, so it's it, these like presenting this to the countries has been one of the one of the um, how I say I mean it has been the the, the power uh, visual power for countries to understand weakness right and then we did not have to to lobby for reviewing and revisiting uh, criminalization of wildlife but uh, but countries are seeing. Uh, things that are that are wrong and they are right now all all of four jurisdictions are engaged in some kind of legal reform uh, based on this analysis i think this is my last oh okay sorry and then uh, as a secondary subproduct because uh, we were collecting the the sentences and the legal provisions related to offenses obviously we are learning a little bit about penalties and we start seeing that uh, uh, another set of taxonomies is going to be necessary for for standardizing penalties for analysis uh, and then we discover up to 22 different penalty uh, types that countries are using for specific wildlife crimes right the, the basic and the, the basic ones that we know is fines and confiscation product destruction imprisonment but we discover warning letters um, public register of environmental offenders, uh, reintroduction to NATO, repatriation, reimbursement of the process expenses, right? So these taxonomies, again, all these taxonomies have, have the power of, of become global uh, elements for standardization. We discover also up to eight different ways where the penalties are set. So it's not, it's not so easy as, as just uh, using local currency, right? There are countries uh, indexing the fines by what they call the criminal unit or, or some financial or economic index. Uh, some others are, are linked to the number of specimens or the market value of the specimens or even the offender's income. So again, these are all lists that will help us for systematization. And then the last one, uh, up to 52 or 53, different mitigating and aggravating circumstances that we are also trying to compile and organize in a taxonomy because are the criteria that are allowed to court for courts to consider when, def when, when defining a crime that usually is expressed in the criminal code with a, with a bracket, right? Let's say a fine between $1,000 and $2,000. So, so the, the judge it's, it's using the criteria that the law is citing to define the, the fee. So also we are also getting the possibility of taxonomy. So this is like new doors are open for the future to, to continue the, the taxonomic development. And this is all for now, back to Jacob. Thank you, Maria. So, so you can see that we have all of these laws across different countries. And I, as a conservationist, and one very much oriented towards policy, would think that I know a decent amount about environmental conservation law. But all of a sudden, my interest in wildlife offenses 
has me looking at 32 pieces of legislation in a certain country and 17 other pieces of legislation in another country and basically getting lost in, in, in chaos, particularly if I wanna make any comparisons. So this tool starts to systematize our thinking around those sorts of comparisons. Uh, incomplete, of course, uh, incomplete in terms of as this is expanded to other countries, we'll continue to develop. And also incomplete because of course, specific context of individual countries, you know, we know as, uh, it cannot be captured in a taxonomy. And as conservationists, we're very accustomed to dealing with taxonomies, right? Of, of, of biodiversity in, the, in that context. And we know that they have all sorts of limitations and we use different species concepts and different approaches. But I think it's very interesting to apply that same sort of logic to a more systematic and structured and comparative view of the legal world that governs the species and places that we're interested in. And I just wanna provide one final example of that, <clears throat> which has to do with one of the most kind of basic uh, offenses which Maria has been talking about as an example throughout. And that's the idea of hunting protected wildlife. And again, for our illegal wildlife trade context, we wanted to know how is this sanctioned in different countries? And so here are the eight countries that we started with for this taxonomy. And the question is, what are the different types of fines and imprisonment that are happening? But you see already that there are, in some countries are dealing with administrative fines from administrative law. Other countries are dealing with criminal fines from criminal law. So even approaching from very different sectors. Some countries are focusing on uh, imprisonment and others not. And of course, what you can see here, right, in standardized currency, these are all in, in U converted to US dollars. You can see a huge range in minimum and maximum fines and imprisonment terms. Really, really huge. If you digest these numbers for just a moment. Now, this, this tells us, of course, something about how wildlife trade is sanctioned in different countries, which is going to be of interest to us if we're interested in getting tough on crime or deregulating or making uh, things less, you know, criminal fines fairer to those who are caught or what have you. But what's also, of course, really important is to start to put these in, in greater context. And Maria mentioned that one of the things that allows us to do that is the facets that were collected from law, right? Let me give you some examples of that because I think for me, it was really interesting because it forced me to recognize and, and, and contend with certain levels of complexity. For example, if we, and, and sorry, not only to deal with that complexity, but also recognizing that, wait a minute, different countries are taking fundamentally different approaches to sanctioning wildlife law, com, uh, wildlife crimes. And so what's the right one? Should there be a harmonization across countries? Which ones do I agree with? Which ones would I wanna lobby on or not? So let's just take the example of Brazil, for example. You see that this is, there's a certain criminal fine, a minimum and maximum, but these are set per specimen, per individual of animal that was illegally taken. Now, this is really important because we know that in other countries, there's just a fine. So it doesn't matter if you have one pangolin or a thousand pangolins, You've broken the law. Brazil specifically addresses that by saying it's per specimen. Now that tiny detail, right, which is could make all of the difference in the world for the conservation outcomes in terms of how we approach enforcement. Another is, remember, one of the facets was motivation. So whether you have uh, hunted illegally this protected species with an intention of profit or not profit, for example, subsistence or, or recreational personal use, determines whether the judge should consider giving you the maximum or minimum fine. Now that's really interesting if we're interested, for example, in distinguishing between organized and commercial wildlife trade versus subsistence use. We may criminalize subsistence use, but this is telling us in Brazil that we want to criminalize it in a slightly different way that is presumably more equitable. Another example, here in Indonesia, I mentioned jurisdiction that I work in a lot. You see that there are only maximums set. And that maximum only applies if you committed that offense with intentionality. There's no minimum. Okay, that's, that's, that's fine. Uh, but how do I prove, if I'm a prosecutor or a conservation investigator, how do I prove intentionality? Any defendant who's claiming that they say, well, I was trading this wildlife, but I didn't know it was illegal. Well, suddenly we have this legal loophole centered around this idea of intentionality that means that the judge is no longer compelled to give the maximum fine 
for example. One more, Costa Rica, which is my home country, and, and as you'll probably know, is, is a hallmark, you know, is often lauded for its, its, um, its, its kind of conservation success around the world. Well, if we think about how they, how they apply sanctions for protection, uh, against hunting of protected wildlife, you see that they only use, they, they do have fines, uh, but they're only used for non-protected species. If you hunt a protected species, you can't buy your way out with a fine. The automatic sanction is gonna be one of imprisonment, loss of freedom. So perhaps it's not surprising that Costa Rica has you know, a very you know, good conservation outcomes. If you get caught trading wildlife in Costa Rica, the sanctions are incredibly severe, much more severe than lots of other countries. And the law doesn't even give you the option of, or the judge or the prosecutor or a plea bargain of seeking a fine. Automatically, it's imprisonment, really draconian. Uh, if we look at uh, Mexico, Maria was also talking about the fact that there's different types of sanctions and different ways of setting out those sanctions. You know, I was thinking that, you know, fines are fines, right? We just hit, we, you know, we've got lots of groups lobbying for greater fines, but it's not necessarily, or lesser fines, but it's not just about the amount, it's about how that amount is chosen. So in Mexico, the fines are based on offender salary with an argument that that helps to make things more equitable, that a fine that is appropriate for a rich person should be different than a, pine, a fine for a poor person. Of course, though, this also creates opportunity for loopholes. I can claim that my salary is very low, or maybe most of my income is earned through illicit means, illegal means, and so you don't see my salary, it's invisible. So it also creates spaces for, for, for loopholes. Um, the fine also determines, is also linked to whether that individual is alive or dead, presumably because it influences, I don't know, ability to uh, reintroduce that individual uh, into the wild. But what's really interesting here is that when we have comp discussions about criminalization of wildlife or getting strong on wildlife crime, we really need to be a, not only a little bit, but indeed a lot more nuanced. And there's a huge amount that we can learn when we start comparing legislation across countries. And indeed, you know, it can generate lots of ideas, especially when it comes to times of legal reform. And indeed, we are in a period of legal reform. There have been huge calls across the world to ban wildlife trade in response to COVID, or some perhaps more sane, nuanced calls for saying, well, let's do better uh, governance of wildlife trade. Let's establish laws that, that better address our public health concerns. Perfectly legitimate. But what does a call to ban or to better regulate or to better govern wildlife mean? What are the mechanics? Wildlife? How do we define wildlife? Are we talking about protected species? What about fish? What about, uh, what about insects? You know, these are all wildlife potentially, and it depends on how that is defined in law. And of course, what areas of legislation, if we're interested in zoonosis, Maria was talking about earlier, well then presumably you're gonna have health laws that apply. Well, all of a sudden a conservationist is talking about a completely different area of law that has not traditionally been in our wheelhouse, that our NGOs and our practitioners and our scientists uh, and, and the government agencies that are charged with protecting wildlife have never dealt with before. We can think of also other areas like online trade. Well, when have conservationists dealt with internet rules, right? These are, these are new frontiers that equally govern the wildlife resources that we're interested in. Ban wildlife trade in all countries in the same way. And in, okay, let's say we are gonna ban wildlife trade. What sorts of sanctions might be appropriate? Do we want the same sanctions for all types of offenders under all circumstances in all country contexts? Or are they gonna be nuanced, nuanced and different? And what should that look like? We're arguing that more systematic understanding of legislation and more effort to make meaningful comparisons, apples to apples comparisons across countries is definitely challenging, but can yield a lot of insights uh, for, for improved governance of wildlife resources, whatever that social or environmental outcome is that you're looking for through that improved governance. Uh, so here are our details. Um, of course, you can learn more about Maria's uh, platform, Legal Atlas, um, and also about our work through the Cover Conservation Governance Lab um, at Lancaster University in the UK. Um, and specifically, I also want to highlight uh, our current initiative that Maria has been a collaborator on as well around conservationlitigation.org, where we're also focusing on civil lawsuits as an additional set of tools that allow us to uh, look at wildlife and uh, uh, wildlife offenses. Um, so 
we'll end there and invite uh, hopefully some questions. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Jacob, Maria, for a very interesting um, presentation. Um, I'd like to open it up to, to questions. So if you are happy to unmute, you can unmute yourself and ask your question straight out. Thank you very much for this opportunity. We have talked about uh, site slow. And uh, for instance, in a country like ours in Tanzania, we, we, we do not have sites law incorporated into wildlife protection or into combating wildlife crimes. How can we incorporate sites law into conservation laws, especially for the growing countries like Tanzania? Did I understand site is law? Well, site is law, okay. Well, countries, we saw a couple of approaches. We saw countries creating a specific site is regulation uh, to bring uh, the convention into the national level. Uh, usually these regulations are, are mimicking the convention in the description of the, of the procedures for the permits, and, but, but are specific in nominating the national authorities uh, management authorities, scientific authorities, and yeah, and, and developing a little bit more um, details on what is the relationship between customs and uh, and the wildlife authority. And the other approach that we see is an amendment of the wildlife legislation to incorporate a this chapter. But yeah, I mean, I, this is the two things we saw. I want to highlight, though, uh, Baraka, that uh, Nepal, for example, did not have CITES national legislation until, I think, 2017, when they implemented it. And I think they would have done well to ha uh, have used a slightly more structured approach to developing that new legislation, because indeed many countries still don't have operation good, op good or any operationalizing legislation. But in Nepal, what happened was they said, if it's a CITES-listed species, all trade Domestic and international is banned. But in fact, most of you will know that that is not what the CITES Convention even asks for. It says that there's a small number of species that are Appendix 1 for which commercial trade should be banned. But the majority of species are part of this Appendix 2 band for which trade is legal but must be regulated. So you must have quotas, for example. You must have um, some sort of a management authority and permitting to make sure that trade is sustainable and a science basis for that. So this is really what highlights that when you hit one domino, it starts to affect different areas of legislation because if you want to bring in meaningful studies legislation, it's not just about banning wildlife trade. It's about having a system that would allow appendix two species to be legally traded, which means that then you need legislation about quotas. Well, quotas for what? All species or some species? Uh, what is the process through which quotas are established? If quotas are broken, how are they sanctioned? So the question that you ask is a very good one, but the response has to be complex by definition, because if you are opening up legal trade or regulating legal trade in an area that used to be gray, then again, you hit the domino and all sorts of other types of subsidiary legislation is going to be affected. And I have to be honest, this is what I, as a conservationist, until I really started working with, with legal analysis, didn't realize. But as I call for stronger enforcement or call for countries to establish CITES rules at the local level, we have to recognize what that actually looks like to be meaningful. Because as we all know, a paper law is useless, that cannot be operationalized is useless, or worse, a paper law that doesn't do, doesn't even reflect what we wanted it to do is, is worse than useless. And I think it's often what we end up with when we don't engage with these, these, these mechanics, these nuances. Thanks, Baraka. Anybody else? Maybe I can go in the meantime. Um, in, in the paper and in the, the presentation just now, you, you referred to the, the facets and comparing facets between neighboring countries. So you can kind of identify loopholes and standards um, in, in the various countries. Would, would you say that the focus should be for neighboring countries to, to go through this process? 
Um, if, you, if you think think of the SADC, the Southern African Development Corporation countries, um, where you know in, in, in many of, of the SADC countries there are specific um, poaching and illegal wildlife trade issues, would, would it be of great benefit to those countries to, to go through this process um, and to kind of see where somebody might be lacking or not lacking and try and standardize things? Is, is that how the intent is to, to use this? Well, I think it's advisable mostly because the big trends in wildlife trade are online train and transnational crime, right? I mean, this is happening and and we work in the Horn of Africa because the the road for for trafficking for cheetahs, for example, is crossing four different jurisdictions. So so how are you gonna uh, have a collaborative enforcement regional efforts with this complexity, right? With every part of the of the chain is subject to such a different levels of of penalties so so for me yes it's worth it the effort and and to start with because as, as Jacob was saying it's so complex that we don't even know where we are standing up I mean when when police of two different countries sit together they are not even clear what are the differences and the commonalities in in their law so I think it's crucial uh, and obviously there are there are many crimes that are, let's say, or, or many acts that are more domestic rooted, right? For example, I don't know, how do you decide to legislate scientific research or exhibitions of wildlife in your country, but many of them really with import export and hunting, I mean, they, they just cross borders. So I think it's time, at least at the regional level. And then as Jacob was saying, I mean, the big questions now globally is like, should we harmonize? Right and and some parts or, or I mean there is many questions open in the air that we don't have an answer but we need to start understanding what is what is being done at this point and so many approaches I mean the difference that Jacob was highlighting in so many approaches in penalizing that that what you have the foundational it's it's a different philosophy of how you yeah how you approach. Uh, penalization, right? Uh, so I think it's time to to discuss in, in all these crimes that are so transnational. I am a little bit wary, though, of harmonization, and I think I mean I think there's certain areas, particularly for transnational crimes, where it's where it's really kind of a, a low hanging fruit and quite obvious. But you know, we have some countries who, that have like Costa Rica, you can't harvest anything, right? But we have other countries that actively promote and, and enable sustainable use. So those are those kind of very foundational differences. And so harmonizing across those countries is gonna be completely inappropriate. Illegally hunting an undulate here in the UK versus you know, uh, in, in the South African context is likely, you know, the motivations might be fundamentally different. And so our approaches to sanctioning them are gonna probably be very different too, right? Here it's gonna be some rich guy killing things for fun on his land. And that might indeed be the context in South Africa as well, but there may also be issues of traditional harvest or subsistence, things that are very unlikely to ring in the same way here. And so we have to be, I think harmonization has its benefits, but we also have to recognize that there's a reason we have different laws. And that's because our histories and our contexts and our needs and our societal values are fundamentally different. Um, and, and I think that also needs to be accommodated. Absolutely. But, they, but there's still benefit in, in, in comparing things, even if one does not move towards harmonization. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because yeah. we learn a lot by cross comparison. I mean, many jurisdictions will be adjusting, not harmonizing, but maybe adjusting based on examples, right? Now in the, harmon in the effort in the Horn of Africa, we are not pushing harmonization exactly, but we are offering in every section of the law that we are reviewing, it's like, okay, these are, these are different approaches. We don't even can call it best practices because it's not a best practices until it really has the power to be fully global, right? But there is so many approaches to permitting, approaches to captive breeding, and what is important is that we could compare, and okay, there is 10, 10 different ways to do it, right? And, and start generating new questions of what is the implication of each one, what is more convenient for me? And I think, yeah, there's, there's tons of knowledge gap to fill in the legal area for wildlife management. I mean, even for us, I mean, we discover every day 
new ways to do things. For us, this taxonomy, I mean, for me having for the first time a full list of, of illegal means for hunting, right? It was, it was the first time I, uh, I saw it in that way, right? And it's just very valuable pieces of information. Mm. What is the anybody else? Well, there's a question in the chat. Um, is it possible to go for a, for an international convention for a uniform wildlife law? You may have partly addressed that already, but do you want to comment on that, Jacob? I well, think we've spoken a little about harmonization, but I think there might be, and indeed there are efforts, for example, to address certain areas. So for example, the current effort to make wildlife crime a serious international wildlife crime, to, uh, international wildlife trade, a serious and organized crime to make sure that it's recognized. There are efforts uh, for specific elements of it to make it harmonized. But for the reasons that I've mentioned, I think that uh, something truly uniform is not only inappropriate, but also very unlikely. Very unlikely. Countries, countries want control over their own legislation. And, you know, yes, we see it in the WTO and so on, but I think that this idea of kind of one world environmental organizations or of standardized laws with enforcement power for the environment sector is something that we're a long way off from. And indeed we've seen huge reluctance in the climate sector for anything with actual teeth and standardization. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, then there's a common comment from Jennifer Seven, who says, I want to thank you for all your work on this topic. Very useful. And hopefully it will lead to more communication across agencies and countries and a more unified approach will result. Um, she unfortunately had to leave early. Um, maybe as a, as, as a last quick one, so I don't see any other questions in the chat and we are just about on time or just over time. Um, to, to, to follow up on my earlier question of you know, comparing between countries, say in, in a particular reg region, um, how does one go about that? Is that something that Legal Atlas, for example, is open to assist, assist with or what, what, what would the process be? Sorry, can you repeat the question I was answering? one of the participants that is asking the link for the paper. And oh, no worries. Um, I, I, was, I was just wondering how, how does one go about, let, let's say in Southern Africa, if we say we were interested in comparing legislation across, across countries um, to look at those facets and try and identify standards and loopholes. Um, how, how does one go about that? Is that something that Legal Atlas offers as a, as a service or, or, or well, the, the truth is that we have been working based on projects, right? Um, as this UK, UK DEFRA um, sponsor. And I mean, the good thing of the platform is that uh, the idea is that every result we get, we are going to host it on the platform. So as soon as we have this functionality, the four countries that now have been reviewed are going to be there for, for consultations and open to everybody. And as as we progress in making analysis to other countries, yeah, results will be, will be also accessible. Uh, we work uh, as much as possible in partnerships with internships in countries. So, I mean, for example, if any legal school in South Africa with the team of students would like to join, I mean, we could coach the process and we will do the analysis together, for example, right? So. Okay, okay. Unfortunately, it's just, yeah, it requires a lot of manpower at this point. But as the, as the country, for the countries that, that we've worked on and as new countries come in, it's all open access and free online. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, the, the four countries uh, in the Legal Atlas website, there is a publication, it's called Gap Analysis for Ethiopia, for, um, for Yemen, all this, you can download it and the annex includes the, the five, the list of the 500 with the, with the analysis, so yeah, it's accessible. Somebody was asking for the, yeah, the, oh, okay, you put out also the link to the paper right now in the chat for everybody. Thank you, yes, I, I see there's, there's one more question from um, Mindy Yan. Um, it seems that punishments are heavily dependent on either the conservation status or the reverence of a particular species. Does this only perpetuate the unintentional black market value for the animal at risk? 
And then there's a follow-up post to say, to clarify, I was thinking it may be comparable to the unintended increase in illegal drug trafficking after the war on drugs. This strikes me as part of a broader question about whether enforcement has unintended consequences and whether regulation provokes black markets or not. Um, I mean, that's, that's actually a really interesting uh, discussion. It's well beyond the scope of what we're doing here. We're not necessarily calling for more or less regulation. We're simply analyzing the laws that are on the books and allowing for, for, for things to be analyzed, including not just stopping people from trading wildlife, but also facilitating legal trade and sustainable trade. I think that's really important. Abuse of a quota or establishing a quota, things like that. Um, but your point about whether regulation or deregulation has unintended impacts, this is an issue which is long debated and indeed for which I'm very confident we do not have a clear answer. Uh, we know that uh, enforcement can lead to black markets, but we also know that enforcement can also lead to shutting down illegal trade. It's a function of the trade dynamics and how much resources you invest in enforcement. Uh, but it's, a, it's certainly an interesting area of debate. Thank you. Um, are there any kind of last question that anybody would like to, to ask? You're welcome to unmute and go. If not, then um, we, we can maybe wrap up. And I, I'd like to thank you again for, for your time. I know it's not just a matter of showing up and, and running through a, a presentation. Um, it takes time to prepare and, and thank you for, for a really interesting talk. Um, and thank you also to, to, to our audience participants and, and the questions asked. And I can maybe let you know we, we've had participants from the USA, from Munster in Germany, from Namibia, from Chennai in India. Um, Barakas in Serengeti in Tanzania, um, and then of course a, a couple of us from, from South, Af South Africa too. So um, maybe as a, as a last thing, I'd like to remind you that we will have another seminar next Wednesday. Um, that one is scheduled for 10 GMT, um, 2200 GMT. And that will be by Reed Noss from the Florida Institute for Conservation Science. And that is on improving species status assessments under the US Endangered Species Act and implications for multi-species conservation challenges worldwide. Um, I hope to see some of you again next week. Um, and with that, oh, there's also somebody from Zimbabwe. Um, with that, thank you. Thank you again and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity.